Hi, today's sermon is based on Matthew 22 verses 1 to 80, 1 to sorry, 1 to 14, the parable of the wedding banquet. Let's pray before we start. Father God, I pray that my words are yours, that they can direct from your heart into ours and that through them we are changed to be more like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can tell you that I've had a bit of a week of it. I really have. On Monday, it was raining cats and dogs. And when I took the uh, dog out, I wore my wellies and they absolutely killed me. And then on Wednesday, we went to the supermarket and bought enough food to feed an army. And I had to carry the bag back. And I tell you, it weighed a ton. And then when I got home, I was so tired, I could have slept for a week. And then do you know what else happened? You won't believe it. Rena had the cheek to tell me a million times to stop exaggerating. I died laughing every time. You may have noticed a bit of hyperbole in that first little thing that I've just said. And hyperbole comes from a Greek word meaning excess. It's a figure of speech that uses extreme exaggeration to make a point or show emphasis. It's the opposite of understatement. And if you read today's reading, you can see that it is no understatement. And I do wonder when reading it, whether Jesus was fond of a bit of hyperbole. Now, if you received an invitation to a party you really didn't want to attend, what would you do about it? I bet you would not abuse and murder the postman. Because that's what happens in this parable. And uh, maybe Jesus is using some hyperbole here. Have you ever invited someone to a party who didn't turn up? You cooked and you cleaned and you decorated and the table was all set and the candles were lit and the music was playing. Everything was ready, but the guests didn't turn up. Did it make you so angry that you went and found them and killed them and burned down their houses? Probably not but that's what happens in this parable. And I do hope that Jesus is using hyperbole. This is the parable of the king's son's wedding. It's so outrageous and so shocking that it begs to be taken seriously, but not literally. To hear this parable and decide that God is an angry king, who if he doesn't get his way, destroys his own people and burns down their cities, simply doesn't fit with the God that I know, the God that we see in Jesus through all of the four Gospels. This may be a parable of judgment, but it might not be the judgment that we think it is. Speaking about the first group of guests, the king says, those I invited did not deserve to come, implying that those in the second invited group did deserve to come. Does this leave you feeling uncomfortable? Because it certainly does me. It leaves me wondering whether I'm in the first group or the second group. Am I deserving or not deserving? And I wonder if that uncomfortableness about Jesus's judgments rises from an assumption that God judges us the way that we often judge others. Often our judgments of others are judgments of exclusion. We emotionally remove those people to be outside of our lives. But what if it's just the opposite with God? What if Jesus is trying to shock us into seeing that the kingdom of heaven is not according to our standards? What if God's judgment on our lives is one of grace, acceptance and invitation? The judgment of inclusion, not exclusion. And if that's true, then what separates or distinguishes the first invited guests from the second invited guests? Now the difference is, isn't, that one was more deserving than the other. The first invited guests were the recipients of the king's invitation and favour, and so were the second invited guests, and so was the man who showed up without a wedding robe. They were all invited, they were all favoured, None of them had done anything to earn or deserve this invitation. It was just given. And if that's true for them, it's true for us. The 
difference isn't that the king likes one group more than he likes the other group. His sole motivation is to share his banquet and he wants anyone and everyone to join in his celebration and be part of his kingdom and life. Both groups were given the same opportunity. And if it's true for them, then it's true for us. The difference isn't that some guests are good and others are bad. There's no judgments made, no judgments on their beliefs, their behaviour, their attitudes, their morals. On the contrary, with the second round of invitations, the king tells his servants to go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And they did. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. If that's true for them, then it's true for us. So what is it? What is the difference between those who were not worthy and those who were? Well, there seems to be only one thing that disting sorry, distinguishes the first invited guests from the second invited guests. And the word is presence. The second invited guests, guests turned up. The first invited guests did not. The wedding hall was filled with the second invited guests, but the first invited guests, it said, would not come. That's the only difference between the two groups. This parable is talking about God's kingdom, not ours. And the key to our life in God is to just show up, to be present. That's a lot easier said than done, because to be present is difficult work. Think how difficult it is to be present to another person in your life. So it means making the other person a priority. It means seeing them for who they are, not who we want them to be or who we think they should be. It means being open to having them in our lives, being vulnerable, giving over our life to another person. It means really listening to what they have to say not just to what we hear or what we want to hear. It means letting go of our own agendas, our fears, our prejudices. It means bringing and offering all that we have and all that we are. And if we're not doing this with others, then we're probably not doing it with God. All too often we tend to go our separate ways, as it says in the parable, to our farms and our businesses which means we are busy, tired, distracted. There's work to be done and money to be made. After all, if we don't earn it or work for it, we assume it has no value. You get what you pay for, yeah? We convince ourselves we have better things to do and better places to be. And that's what the first invited group did. But what they didn't realise, and what we often forget, is that there is no life outside the banquet. There's no life outside God's kingdom. To show up and to be present is to be deserving before God. It's that simple and it's that difficult. We don't earn or prove our deservedness as a requirement to entering the banquet. We show up, we are present and we discover for ourselves the worth that God has always seen in us. That's when our life begins to change. But what about the bloke who turned up without a wedding robe? Sounds like this issue was about a lot more than the dress code violation. Yes, he turned up. Yes, he was present. But something else was missing. Jesus says he was speechless. He was there, but he wasn't really there. Jesus is reminding us that there are times when we show up, but we're not really present. Our body's there, but we're not in the room. So here's what I wonder. What if this man had said something? He'd not been speechless. He'd said something, anything. What if he'd just made his presence known? What if he'd said something like, I was hungry and I smelled the food, and I trusted you'd feed me. 
where I was lonely and I saw the lights on and I trusted you'd take me in. Where I was thirsty and I knew there'd be wine and I trusted you'd give me a drink. I was naked and I knew the people around me would be well dressed and I trusted you'd clothe me. I was sad and grieving. I heard music and laughter and I trusted that I could share in your joy. I was empty and I saw abundance and I trusted you would fill me. I was dying and I saw the door was open and I trusted you'd give me life. What if you just said one of those things or a thousand other things like them? It would have been enough. He would have shown up with all that he was and all that he had. He would have been present. And then the king would have said to him, Oh, my dear friend, I'm so glad you got my invitation. I'm so glad you're here. You're so deserving. You're so worthy. And if that's true for him, then it's true for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that all we need to do is just turn up and be present. Lord, I pray against all the distractions in our lives, all the things that steal our time and our energy away from being just in your presence, being there in the room, fully in the moment, not missing a thing, talking to you, hearing from you, enjoying your presence, enjoying your banquet, drinking and eating and laughing and just spending time with you. Lord, forgive us where we've wandered off. Forgive us where we haven't been fully present to you, our King and our glorious Master. Lord, please think of us as deserving. Look upon us today, forgive us and allow us back into your kingdom. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen.